Well, good night, everybody. I'm going to be waiting for a minute or so for others to join us. And uh, you have seen the subject matter that I'm going to be dealing with tonight. I'm trying to stay off issues that are current, that are happening right now, because it is what you call a crazy season. And no matter what you say, some people take it to mean one thing, and uh, they tend to be very acidic in their retort. And then you have to now uh, take the necessary action so that they will not be verbal on your page again. So I'm diverting from pertinent issues. And I'm dealing with a subject that is also pertinent. But it's not that uh, controversial. Uh, if I talk about Corona, I talk about politics now, it's going to be, you know, people can't handle that kind of subject. They say you're a preacher, you should shut your mouth and just talk about Jesus all the time. And if you do that, they get offended. <laughs> so you do your damned and you don't your damned. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 28. 1 Samuel chapter 28 is where I'm getting my first reference of Scripture from. And Matthew chapter 4 is where I'm getting my second reference of scripture from. And I'm going to show tonight the seven reasons. Seven reasons, basically seven reasons why people go to the Obia house, the Juju house, the Voodoo house, the native doctor, the palm reader, the charmer, the necromancer, the hydromancer, the moon monster, the bibliomancer, the false prophet, the real prophet. Why do people go to these individuals to get messages, to get revelation, to get knowledge, to do some of these things that I'm going to be talking about tonight? And I want you to call a friend and tell them the boom is on and he's going into the scripture. He's going to show us seven reasons why people go to get supernatural information why they go to the uh, obia the juju the voodoo they walk for you they go to mother the sifar the rub the pin on the charm and all that other stuff raquel i just want you to know that i got on my apostles pin and i'm in an apostolic zone tonight there will be no pause for commercial breaks i'm not taking any prisoners tonight I'm just going to hit and keep on going. Are you ready? 1 Samuel chapter 28. You need to take note of these scriptures so when I'm done, you can have the scripture to read it for yourself. Let God be true and every man a liar. <laughs> Emil Magaro, how are you doing, bro? I saw you the other day, but I couldn't say hi because you were hustling off. And I was hustling off. I said, oh, that's my buddy right there. But hey. All right, here we go. 1 Samuel chapter 28. I'm going to read extensively tonight because I want you to get the text context so that you don't get the pretext. You can't just grab a scripture, one little scripture, and make a sermon out of it. You have to get the background and all the other necessary information so that there can be a balanced view on what we're talking about. Here we go. In those days, the Philistines gathered their forces to fight against Israel. Ashish said to David, You must understand that you and your men will accompany me in the army. And David said, Then you will see for yourself what your servant can do. Ashish replied, Very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. This is David going to fight against the people of God. And then we see the reference here of, with Saul at the medium at Endor. He goes to get opinion, get messages from a medium. This guy used to have the prophet at his disposal, Samuel the prophet. But due to his disregard and disrespect, Samuel stopped uh, having any communication with him. Let me tell you something. Disrespect will cause people to exit your life. People that God has sent as destiny helpers, and some of them will never go back into your life ever again. There are some people like that. I'll have them at a distance, high and right, and there I go. 
They are way too disrespectful. They have no manners. They have no brought ups. Even though their parents train them, they still prefer to be acidic, caustic, and disregarding, very disrespectful people. No manners whatsoever. They talk to you anyhow, if and when they feel like they talk about you like a dog, and then they don't expect you to cut them out of your life. No, you've got to cut off some people because tomain poison will form in your system if you don't get rid of them. If you don't get rid of them, they will get rid of you. If you don't kill the thing, the thing will kill you. Sometimes you've got to take action against the souls in your life who don't want to hear your counsel. All right. Now Samuel was dead, and all of Israel had mourned for him and buried him in his own tongue of Ramah. Saul had expelled the medium and spiritists from the land. The Philistines assembled and came and set up camp at Shunem, where Saul gathered all Israel and set up camp in Gil at Gilboa, as a mountain. When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. When he saw how many they were in number, and David was with them, terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dream or urim or prophets. He's asking the Lord, Lord, what should I do? Now he knows the Lord. It's like all of these prayer meetings you have now, that this thing is wrong and people are terrified. Now they know the Lord. Now they're praying in the street. They don't care. They're asking for prayer all over the place. I have never gotten so many prayer requests like I'm getting now from people who used to spit in my face and call me brother in a sarcastic, condescending tone and talk about you Christians and you fanatic and blah, blah, blah. But now, even presidents are calling for prayer. Brother, you have a word from God, and when you do hear and give them the word of God, they still don't believe because it sounds too positive. They think you're just giving them information to make them feel nice. God wasn't speaking to him by dream, that's all. So it means that God speaks to humanity via dreams or through the medium of dreams. You've got to watch your dreams. I did an extensive study on dreams and dream language. I, I, I sat down about 30 times. If you go back in my, in my Facebook page, you'll find a teaching on dreams. I've got about 30 of them. Don't ask me to get one for you. You know, get off your duff and do the, do the necessary two-minute search and you will find it. And then he said by Urim, that's another uh, means, that's going to take another study to get that done. Uh, nor by the prophets. Samuel was the greatest of them at that time in the life of Saul. He disregarded Samuel, wouldn't listen to him when he gave him the word of the Lord. When Samuel said kill, the, kill every animal, he left the fat ones, etc. He was constantly a very disregarding kind of person. Saul is like, there are some churches I would not go back to because of the disregarding manner in which they approach the word of God. And then later on, down when the word starts coming to pass, then they want you to come back and they give you this flimsy apology type thing. But the only reason they want you there is to authenticate their own little ministry that they've got going. And if you come in and join with them, it, it, your name adds a little punch to their punch, adds a little power to their punch. And so people use each other like that. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dream or urim or prophets. And Saul then said to his attendants, find me a woman who is a medium so I may go and inquire of her. He's asking them to go get a witch now because the Lord wasn't speaking to him. Dreams weren't coming. Urim wasn't working. Prophets weren't speaking to him. And so now He's asking for a witch. Imagine, he was the man that banned witchcraft in the country, which is a good thing to do. But now, the banner of witchcraft was seeking out a witch to answer at the time when he was hopelessly outnumbered by the army of Philistia. Yes, sir. Sometimes you, you got to get the momentum going. I got it at World Vision. Sunday morning was just an incredible service. I'd never seen uh, such unity you could feel it you could reach out and touch it but we were not um you know when the service was done we didn't try to shake hands and all that stuff we got together but we socially distanced <laughs> and you see social distancing in the scripture where the lepers had to cry unclean unclean when somebody who was clean 
was uh, approaching them because leprosy was contagious at that time. It was incurable at that time. In this day and time, they have found the cure for leprosy like they are going to find the cure for corona, like they are going to find the cure for diabetes, like they are going to find the cure for cancer. Yes, they're going to find a cure. Uh, medicine and technology is going to be joined beginning this 2020, and mankind is going to do some incredible things in terms of curing diseases. Yes, yes. Find me a medium, a woman who's a medium. She's an intermediary. She's getting information from the, the world of the dead, the spirit world, and she's passing on that information to the human beings who have come to inquire of her. There is one at Endor, they said. Now the question is, if Saul had banned them, how did these guys who were close to Saul know where to find a Obia woman? There's always somebody in church who knows where to find a Obia woman. <laughs> and sometimes it's the pastor. <laughs> it makes it even worse that men of the cloth are, are seeking out for the voodoo juju. Native doctor, Sifar man, Obia occultic practitioner, to get a message. There is one at Endor, they said. They knew where to find her. They didn't have to wait. They didn't have to inquire. They answered immediately. Yeah, pim pim indeed. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes, took, away, took off his royal garment. And at night, he and two men went to the woman. They're sneaking up on her like Nicodemus by night. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one that I would name. But the woman answered and said to him, the woman was more reluctant to do her voodoo juju stuff than Saul who had banned witchcraft. Sometimes you have incidents where the man who's called a sinner is more righteous than the church folk. <laughs> Hey, the Lord have mercy. Anyhow, surely you know what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for me, for my life, to bring about my death? She said, you know Saul will kill me if he finds out. She was talking to Saul, and she didn't know. Why? Her seafar ability was not that great. Here's the man himself who banned witchcraft and juju from the land, came to her disguise as somebody else, and with all she could see far, she couldn't see near. <laughs> all these Obia people, you know what I tell them? I tell them, look, you don't have to take all this fowl and chicken and duck and rum and money from people. What you can do is buy lottery tickets, see the number, and then win every lottery that's come because you can see far. How come you can see far but you can't see near? I never got an answer from them. They just look at me in shock and then they go their way. And they go their way very angry. And sometimes in the night after I told them that, I would get a visit. <laughs> I would get a visit that, you know, the devil is trying to whip me in my sleep or choke me in my sleep or whatever. And then I have to get up and go to war. Yes. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? Saul swore to her by the Lord. A lot of people, when they do their wickedness, they invoke the name of the Lord to do wickedness with. <laughs> he invoking the Lord's name. No wonder the scripture says, not all who say Lord, Lord shall enter the kingdom. Surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Then the woman asked, who shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up Samuel. Now, let me understand here clearly. He wanted a message from the Lord, but the Lord wasn't speaking to him. The Lord's servant Samuel that used to speak to him for years, who had predicted that he would be king when he was chasing ass and couldn't find the donkeys that were lost. Samuel gave him the shoulder of the, of the, of the animal that they killed, sat him down with the elders and prophesied that the donkeys were found that his father was not worried about him, and that he would be the first king of Israel. All of that came to pass. You would think that a man who had, had changed his destiny for good, that he would stick with a man like that. But I'll tell you the truth. There are many people who have received incredible words of prophetic accuracy over the years, and the first thing they do when that word starts to come to pass, they distance themselves from you as far as possible. 
because they don't want much. They, they think that if you are wrong, you will talk about it and tell people that you are the one that made them a king. But the real kingmakers don't say too much. Let them go. One guy uh, told me, he said, you know, pastor, all of the things you said about me came to pass, but um, I have a certain bad way, and I don't want to be around you because I feel like you're seeing my bad way. I said, you wanted me to tell you what the bad way is? He said, no, 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 don't tell me. I said, uh, the bad way is all them women that you got with your wife that you're married to, and she doesn't know she thinks you're faithful. And uh, the next week he asked if he could leave the church because he no longer wanted to be a part of that assembly. And I told him, I'm sorry for your loss. When people want to leave you, let them go. Don't beg them to come back. Don't ask them to come back. Don't write them any letters. Don't make no apologies. Let people go. I have learned to hold people loosely. I'm holding them for the sake of the kingdom, but if they want to go, my hands are open right away. Go. And go in peace, and the Lord go with you. And many times they go because they can't stand the word of the Lord that's on them. They can't wait for God to raise them up to the extent, to the stature and maturity level that they they feel rushed to go and start their own little ministry. And so you've got to let people go. You pastor, stop holding people. Stop begging people. And stop going after them, visiting them, calling them on the phone, taking them to lunch, and begging them to come back to the church. Let them go. Don't, don't. Stop being such a wuss with yourself. Begging people to come back to your church. Let them go. Now listen. And listen well. Hear my heart here. And if you don't understand and hear it, that's your that's no skin off of my nose. I don't like to lose people. I don't care how bad they are. I don't care how good they are. I don't care how poor they are. I don't care how rich they are. As long as they're sitting in that pew and I'm preaching the word of God, I know that change is happening in their life. Some change quicker than others because of the level of yieldedness to the Lord. But at some points, like Jesus lost some people who misunderstood him, you are, not, you are also going to lose some people that misunderstand you. But the point I'm making is, even though I hate losing people, I have lost a lot of people over the years. And I have never gone to beg anybody to come back. If anybody told you I went and begged them to come back, they are lying. Never one time have I gone to beg anybody, can you please come back to church? We need your gift. We need your help. We need your song. We no, no. You want to go? G O go, Galaway, your go, Saman, Kere, walk. And we don't believe in walking that other word. <laughs> yes. Then the woman asked, Whom shall I bring up? Bring up Samuel. Now, Samuel was already dead. Therefore, she could not bring up Samuel. As a, as a tree dies, that's how it remains. It's not going to come back to tell you anything. And so, whatever she was going to bring up would not be Samuel. And so, she was going to conjure up a spirit that was familiar with Samuel. That's what we call a familiar spirit. A spirit that knows you, knows your relatives, knows your family, and is willing to give you information that is accurate. That is where you have to have discernment because accuracy does not mean that it is God who is at work. All accuracy means is that accuracy exists. Don't believe that because somebody is accurate that it is God who is giving them the information. You can get accurate information from an Obia man, a Juju man, a Voodoo man a witch, and a native doctor. The sad thing is that most of the time, these people are way more accurate than these false prophets we got running around in the church. And so he asked her to bring up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she was shocked. She cried out to the top of her voice and said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul! <laughs> now imagine... She's the one walking the obia, and the obia turned back on her. Because something about the countenance of the spirit that she conjured up told her that that was Samuel, and all of a sudden she realized the man hiding behind them raggedy clothes was the king himself, King Saul. Why have you deceived me? 
You are Saul. There's a lot of deception that happens in the Obia house. What that mother is telling you, sometimes your family visit or a friend give her information. Sometimes she got the information from the dark world. It's satanic information. No Obia person can get information from God. God is the only one who tells the truth every time. Therefore, let God be true and every man a liar. Verse 13. The king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? Now, understand this woman could see, even though she was terrified, even though she was a Obia woman, she still had that gift to see. In the same manner that God blesses his people with the word of knowledge, that you know things with a prophetic eye, that you see things, with a prophetic ear, that you hear things. Satan is a master counterfeiter. He is the original photocopier. <laughs> original photocopy. He's the master of manipulation. And he knows how to duplicate what God does so that it looks like it is God in operation. Satan's greatest trick is to pretend that he is giving information as though he were God. And people, as long as they hear information that nobody else is supposed to know, they attribute it to God. There are many times I've gone to different nations and the Lord will give information about the nation, information about the people in the audience. Sometimes you pick out the people, sometimes he gives you their name, sometimes he gives you their phone number, sometimes he gives you how many children they have. And then when the service is done, they run to the car that you're trying to get home with to ask you if you see anything about them. They think you're Obia man. And they tell you, they, they know you work Obia like them. And if you can't give them some information. Anytime people tap into the supernatural or they see you operate with a supernatural ability, they think you are an Obia practitioner. I've been called an Obia man in many countries. Because the people don't know that God can speak to people on this earth. The Spirit will show you things to come. How come you're not seeing anything to come? And you vex with other people who's seeing because you're too lazy to spend time in the presence of God. I just call it like I see it. If you're not hearing from God, it is because you are not paying attention to God or it is because you're too lazy to spend time in His presence so that God will speak to you. God is a speaking God. You see that in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens, the earth, the earth was without form and void, darkness of the face of the deep, and God said, 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 and God kept setting, I know there's no such word, and everything that he said came into view, and when he was done, he said it was very good. Let's go on. The woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. What does he look like, Saul asked? An old man. Wearing a robe is coming up. Then Saul knew it was Samuel. Old man wearing a robe. Samuel loved his robes. Samuel was an old man. And therefore he thought it to be Samuel. And he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He wasn't paying that respect to Samuel when Samuel was alive and in front of him. But now that Samuel is dead and gone, he's bowing down to a ghost. He's bowing down to a duppy. He's bowing down to a jumbie. He's bowing down to a spirit. He's bowing down to a poltergeist. He's bowing down to Caspar, the friendly ghost. He's bowing down to a familiar spirit. He's bowing down to Satan, assuming that he's bowing down to Samuel. A lot of people worship devils, assuming that it is God they're worshiping. And when the brother told them that uh, this thing is invoking demons, they call him before the board and asked him to apologize. But it's too late to apologize. It's too late. Then Saul knew it was Samuel and bowed himself to the ground. And Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up from the dead? It wasn't Samuel, but the devil has to play the role as though it was Samuel. And he's a great actor. He's a superb actor. I was sitting in a home in Bronx, New York, about uh, 2016, uh, couldn't be 2016, 1996. Yes, 1996, there was a blizzard in New York. 
there was snow like nobody's business. There was 72 inches of snow. of a man. He was apparently six foot tall, a nice bronze looking skin, glowing intelligent eyes, dressed all in white and glowing like the sun in all of its strength. And he was watching at me as my, my heart was pounding, my hands were sweating. I was looking at this creature. I thought it was an angel of God. And then the creature telepathically communicated with me and said, if you want me to do anything for you, just ask. But then as it looked at me, I could see evil in its eye and intelligence. And I heard the Spirit of God saying to me on the inside, that's not an angel, that's Satan. And, and Satan was very handsome, very tall, glowing, a hunk from Hollywood itself. Intelligence was oozing out of him. No wonder the Bible said the devil himself is, is, he comes up like if he were an angel of light. And then he was trying to make some kind of deal. If I want to ask for anything, he was going to give it to me. All I needed to do was to not be preaching the truth of scripture because I was going to a church the next day to preach. And somehow he didn't want that sermon that I had already prepared. And I saw why. Because the next day the service started at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning and ended up at 4 o'clock about thereabouts. On Monday afternoon the next day, all kinds of supernatural, spectacular miracles happened there. Satan didn't want it to happen. He came through the door. Satan can walk through walls just like Jesus can walk through walls. And he was trying to make a deal with me not to preach that message, not to preach the truth. Just kind of a compromise with it. And I said no. And he walked back through the door. He said so be it. And he was angry when he said so be it. And walked back through the door. Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. And you need the discernment of the Spirit of God to know shibboleth from sibboleth. That's why I'm telling you, when somebody is preaching the truth, truth is not telling you that it is God speaking to that man or to that woman. Many times people use the truth as their weapon of deception. You got that right, that devil is a liar. He's a disgusting liar. But he lies well, and he doesn't have no fork on his head. He doesn't have any horn on his head. He's a hunk of burning gas. Then Saul knew it was Samuel, verse, uh, verse 16. And he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. And Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me, verse 15, in bringing me up? I am in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has departed from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophet or by dream. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. If God is not talking to a man, then you can't talk to that man. So I have called on you to tell me what to do, as if he wanted somebody to tell him what to do. When Samuel was alive and telling him what to do, Saul would not pay attention to Samuel. Now Samuel is dead and gone. Now he wants to listen to Samuel. Some people are going to miss some people when they take their exit and leave their life. That preacher that has been telling you the truth all these years, you're going to miss him. That friend that you have that's witnessing to you about Christ and his love for you, you're going to miss them one of these days when God removes them from your life by geography or by taking them home to the sweet by and by. You're going to miss them. That preacher who told you the truth, you didn't like him, you've gone to some false prophet. And now you're in all kinds of quandary. Now you want the real word of God. You're going to miss them. Some people have it so good, they don't know they have it so good until they have it so bad. Then they realize, I don't want to go back to that forward ever. They're screaming that now. Too late to apologize. 
So I have called you to tell me what to do. And Samuel said, why do you consult me? Now that the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy, the Lord has done what he predicted through me. I told you this was going to happen. You didn't hear. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David, because you did not obey the Lord nor carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites. The Lord has done this to you today. Sometimes the Lord gives you a position of leadership, wink, wink, so that you will deal with all the lawlessness, the vulgarity, the murders that took place in your nation. But instead of you doing that, you're busy living the good life. And now the rebuke of the Lord is on top of your head and all them acolytes that only want to get rich and don't want to do their job because they are forever too lazy to do what God has called them to do. Let me say that again in a, in a different manner. When God gives you the throne of power, he sometimes gives you the throne of power so you can deal with the worthlessness, the obscenity, the vulgarity, the bloodshedding, and the extraordinary level of theft that you know about. <coughs> but instead of you dealing with it, you're too busy getting your pockets filled and doing your own thing. And you were warned. You were warned to execute the vengeance of the Lord. You were warned to take action against lawlessness. You were warned to deal with the mass murders that took place that you know about. You were warned. But you were way too lazy, way too inept, way too indifferent to the word of the Lord. You wanted to have things your own way. Now you got it your own way. Now it's hot. Now it's hot. Where are the prophets now? Where are all these prognosticators telling you not to do anything? Telling you that everybody has died off. Telling you that you can't have credible evidence. All that evil and not one person has been dealt with. Not one. Just accusations and innuendos. The Lord sometimes gives you the throne and the realm of leadership so that you can deal with the Amalekites. And Samuel said, the Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines. And tomorrow, your sons will be with me. Your sons will die. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Immediately, Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's word. The, the devil was telling him. His strength was gone, for he had eaten nothing all day and all night. Now he's busy fasting. You know how many people are fasting now? You know how many people are praying now? You know how many receive the word of the Lord ad nauseum? They mock the word. They call the preacher the falsest of all false prophets. I will live to see the word of the Lord come to pass. Noah was a false prophet for 120 years until that first drop of rain fell and every monkey was trying to get into that ark, but they could not. Every human who was around Noah at that time were running to the ark. They no longer believed that he was a false prophet because the word took time. They mocked him for 120 years. But the man that they mocked had to be locked up and locked in and locked away as the wrath of God ravaged the land. The waters rose and the waters fell and they all drowned. Now people are locking themselves away as the evil is ravaging the land. Don't you see the connection? Open your eyes. Open your eyes. There's none so blind as he that would not see. There's none so deaf as he that would not hear, even though he has an ear to hear. Many people are going to take stock of themselves because of what's happening now. And some people are so everlastingly wicked and bent on doing iniquity, they will not hear even though you spell it out to them in fine print or in bold print written in red. Let's read another scripture. Matthew chapter 4. Now in this scripture, the devil himself comes to the wilderness where Jesus was fasting and praying. Forty days and forty nights. We used to sing this in the Anglican church. Thou was fasting in the wilds. Forty days and forty nights.
tempted and yet undefiled. Sunbeams scorching all the day. Chilly dewdrops nightly fall. Prowling beasts about thy way. Stone thy pillow, earth thy bed. Yeah, 40 days and 40 nights thou was fasting in the wilds. Tempted and yet undefiled. Sunbeams scorching in the day. Chilly dew drops nightly fall. Prowling beasts about thy way. Stone thy pillow. Earth thy bed. Matthew chapter 4. Now in this lesson, we are going to see Jesus about to get his ministry off track. And the demonic world is paying him careful attention. Now I want to make a point that I've been making ad nauseum. But... People don't listen to good instruction when you tell them, especially when you're one of them. If you had blue eyes and blonde hair and white skin, they'll be paying attention and, and making notes. A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country, in his own family, and when he's at home. Are you feeling a brother? Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. The fact that you're led by the Spirit does not mean that everything is going to be hunky to the dory. Sometimes God will lead you into places where you're going to have some temptation. God's road is not always easy. God's road is not always uh, roses and flowers. Sometimes there are thorns. There are thorny patches that you will walk in. Sometimes he tells you to endure hardness as a good soldier. Other times he'll put you in a good space with air-conditioned rooms that you can just chill and enjoy your life like the one I'm in right now. <laughs> it's hot outside, but our brother is cool and chilling right now. AC is blaring, fan is spinning. It's a nice situation. But it's not always this nice all the time. There are other times when you have to go through your go-through. So Jesus is led by the Spirit, but the devil is coming to tempt him. You're going to have some days in your own desert when demons will come and tempt you. I haven't lost track of where my subject matter is and what I'm talking about. I'm laying a foundation, and because I know everybody is home, I'm taking my time and peeling my pine. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now when it says by the devil, it means Satan himself, not one of his demons. Satan himself. This task was too important to leave it to one of his imps. He is coming himself. That creature that came that night, walked through the door, dressed in white, glowing. I believe that was the man himself, Satan himself. The level of intelligence oozing out of him, the power that was emanating from his body, the fact that I know that he could literally read my mind, he could telepathically get into my brain and give me information, give me what he was saying. I could understand clearly. It was like somebody was shouting loudly in English language, but no words were spoken. And yet he was communicating with me, letting me know I don't like what you're doing. You're messing with my well-laid plan. It took me years to set up this structure, and you with your teaching, you're bringing it down. Let me make you a deal. I can make you ask for anything. I will give it to you. But you know Satan, he never tells you the whole story. Next thing you know, you tie up your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. Sickness and plague break out on you. You get rich, but you can't even enjoy it because you're full of sores, or you have some incurable sickness, or you get crippled. You end up in an accident that takes your mind, and you're sitting in a wheelchair drooling. Satan never tells you the truth. And he never makes a good deal. Look at these rappers and these guys. All of them that signed their soul off with the devil and made their blood oats and their blood packs. And their mother has to die. Their father has to die. Relatives have to die. The price is too high. If you got to get success like that, then it's not worth it. But let me tell you something. As you rise in levels, you preachers watching me, mark my words because I'm telling you the truth. You don't have to believe me, but yet I'm telling you the truth. There comes a plateau in your, in your ministry where if you move from there, 
to a higher zone. You have come in the reins, in the realm, in the vision of the demonic world. You have risen too high for your britches, and the satanic world will come to make a deal with you. As you rise, Satan is going to pay attention to you and send one of his demons or come himself to make a deal with you, to give you superstar status, but you've got to compromise your message, water down your teaching, do whatever he tells you to do, and he, Satan, will flood your church with more people than you can ever handle. He makes those kinds of deals. Satan has an ability to drive people to your church, to your ministry. I know what I'm talking about. The devil has a deal for every preacher. The devil has a deal for every creature. The devil has a deal for every singer. The devil has a deal for every athlete. The devil has a deal for every politician. The devil has a deal for every nation. The devil has a deal. And if you take his deal, you will succeed temporarily. And after a while, like the proverbial Humpty Dumpty, your house of cards will come crashing down because Satan is a liar. He never shows you the fine print, and he never makes a good deal. He always withholds information. And I'm telling you seriously, as long as you begin to rise in levels, when you get to a certain point, Satan will come to you to make a deal with you. And you can get everything you want in this life, but you have to give him your soul. You have to give him your allegiance, and you have to become an emissary of his, his you will become his voice. You will attract people to him and to his kingdom as you exercise your gift. Satan has a deal for everybody as they rise. He will come to make a negotiation with you at some point as you rise. You got 100 members in your church, he will give you 500. You've got 500, he will give you 1,000. You've got 1,000, he'll give you 5,000. He always makes it sound as though he wants you to have more success than God wants you to have. Any deal that Satan makes, he's trying to make God look like a liar. All the time. I'm thinking to myself, why would he want to make me a deal? Isn't God going to give me the same thing? When he was gone, you know what the Lord said? I didn't hear his voice, but I heard his voice. I didn't hear his voice, but I heard his voice. He said, son, Satan will give you anything now that I will give you tomorrow. Satan will give you anything this week that I will give you next week. Satan will give you anything this year that I will give you next year. But when you get it from me, it will last forever and you don't have to lose your soul. But when you get it from him, it's temporary and there will be death running through your family. Satan never makes a good deal. He doesn't tell you the whole story. I'm reading Matthew chapter 4. I'm going back to verse 1. We got time. We got nowhere else to go. Corona is outside and we inside. <laughs> We're taking precautions. We're socially distancing ourselves. Oh, yes, yes. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the willingness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Obviously, the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Tell these stones to become bread. As Willie Nelson sang in We Are the World. As God has shown us by turning stone to bread. And so we all must lend a helping hand. We are the world. We are the children. Of course, God did not show us by turning any stone to bread. I don't know where Willie got his doctrine from. But Willie Nelson, bro, that's not what the scripture said. Jesus did not turn stone into bread. The We Are The World song, as popular as it is, it is wrong. It is unbiblical. It is unscriptural. Jesus never turned stone into bread. But what else is new? Anytime people quote scripture, they never seem to get it right. And when you raise your voice like a trumpet to bring correction, they get offended and call you a hater. 
Well, how come other people didn't see that rev and you coming now to tell us that? I've been saying this from the day they started that song. Say that verse is wrong. I've been sending messages to everybody and their mother. Why you preachers sit down and allow lies to be told about the church? I don't get it. Every time a crime is committed in the nation, they say it's the president's church boys that are doing the crime. And the one guy that talked about their religion and their symbol in their religion, the whole nation was in an uproar. But people can insult the church day after day, day after day, and call criminals the president's church boys, and ain't nobody raising their voice like a trumpet. You need to give the winds a mighty voice. You need to represent the kingdom of God. You need to represent the gospel. You need to be a good soldier for the kingdom. Somebody say a good yes, man. The Bible says we should earnestly contend for the faith. What should we do, A? Eh? We should contend for the faith. How should we do it? Earnestly, fervently, with fire in your belly. Contend for the faith, for God's sake. Stop letting people tell lies on the church that every time a crime is committed, they call it the president's church. Boys, when are you preachers going to get angry? Then when they do come out, they dress nice and they just say nice platitudinous ponderosities. They never say anything that, that may be construed to be controversial. They're just covering their behinds. Grow up here, reverend. Open your mouth like a trumpet. The same way you dragged the brother to court, to, 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 the, to, the, to the thing and told him to apologize. It's the same way you must stand against that wickedness that ascribes criminality to the president, calling him the president's church. Boys, deal with that too, like you dealt with the other one. You all got so much bias and fear. It's obnoxious the way we are led by these so-called men of God. They have partiality like nobody's business. They're afraid of their own shadow. They can rebuke the brother, but they will not rebuke the other guy. And that man is no friend of mine. You all know my story with him. He's no friend of mine. But truth is truth. Total silence from the church. Every week, every practically every day, when a crime is committed, I see them calling them uh, the president's church boys. And ain't nobody making any representation for the church. Where is the church in this nation? Where are the voices of the church? Where are the men of the church? Where are the women of the church? Where are those who will defend the church for God's sake? What kind of Christian are you? That you're so fearful you can't represent anything? Coming out here trying to look good. Coming out here trying to look impressive. And the fights that you're supposed to fight, you ain't fighting that fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Represent the gospel for God's sake. For once in your miserable life, get off your duff. Let God arise and let the enemy be scattered. Oh, yes. Oh, I felt that one. I felt a rocker in my shocker. Let me get back to my stuff. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered and said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Not bread alone, not the material things alone. There is more to life than the material things. There is more to life than the material things. There is more to life than the material things. But you need material things because other people will need it. And if God gives it to you, then you can bless them with it. I don't care what people say. God does not want you to be poverty stricken for the rest of you. I don't care what they say. I don't care who says they don't believe in the gospel of success. I don't care who's preaching it. Nowhere in scripture does God want you dumb on your face, unable to take care of your children, unable to pay your bills, and you have nothing in your pocket. Even God said twice in the Old Testament, when you come to my presence, don't come empty-handed. If you're broke, your hands are empty. God does not want you broke. Don't get me started on that either. Hey, 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 hey. Picking a lot of fights tonight. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. But on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city. Imagine that. This joker is going to the holy city. He's not going to the dance hall. He's going to the holy city. He's not going to the drug house. He's going to the holy city. Then the devil took him to the holy city. And had him stand on the highest point of the temple of all places. If you are the son of God. Throw yourself down. For it is written. He will command his angels concerning you. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. 
Satan knows scripture, but he's quoting them out of their context. And there are many people like that. They have no understanding of the scripture. They have no understanding of what a preacher ought to do. They have no understanding of what a preacher is called to do. I have received many a rebuke from people who don't understand, as my mother would say, A from Bullfoot about ministry, ministry call, ministry gift, the voice of God, what God wants you to do, and doing your specific thing that God has anointed and enabled you to do. I am not called to be a pastor. I am not called to be an evangelist. I am not called to be a prophet. I am not called to be a teacher. I'm called to do what I'm doing right now. And I'm doing that right now. My call is different from yours. You do your business and let me mind my business with God. But here they come. They haven't gone to church. They haven't studied the word. But they want to tell you what to preach, when to preach, how to preach. And what tone of voice you should have when you preach. Many a rebuke. Particularly in this last two months. I've had more people sending me their acidic messages talking about, I will never hear you preach again. I'll never want to hear you. I don't like your ministry anymore. How could you say that? You're a racist. You're no good hungry belly dog. Blah, 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 blah. What else is new? I'm sorry for your loss. You're never going to get it straight like you get it straight from the horse's mouth. And I am that horse. <laughs> yes, yes. Jesus answered, it is written, do not put the Lord thy God to the test. Don't tempt God. Don't test God. Again, the devil. Now, this is the part I want you to pay attention to. Verse 8 is the punchline. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you. Now, the principle is, you cannot give what you do not have. If the devil was going to give Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, it meant that Satan has all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus did not refute what Satan said because what Satan was saying was the truth. The devil is the God of this world. He owns the systems that run the kingdoms of this world. He owns the superstructure. He set it up. He comes with a proposal every time. And he's coming to Jesus just when he's about to get his ministry going. You may not know it, but Satan can see the signs of your rising. And when you are in the season of your rising, you will get satanic, satanic attention coming to make a deal. Coming to tell you, if you do this for me, I will do thus and so for you. I will give you the world. All of these guys that made a deal with the devil, he gave them superstardom. He gave them the, the riches and wealth. He gave them all the women that they want. He, and then he took their father, he took their mother, he took their sister. He started killing the people nearest to them. They never knew that all of that was a part of the deal. But Satan doesn't make any good cook deal. His deals are always raw deals. Don't dance with the devil. His music is no good. All this will I give you, he said. If you will bow down and worship me. That's what he wants. He wants your allegiance. He wants your respect. He wants your worship. He wants you to take your eyes off God and put your eyes on him. Satan always wants that. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written. Worship the Lord your God. He wants your worship. And serve him only. He wants to be served. Then the devil left him and angels came and ministered unto him. Now when it says the devil left him. It doesn't mean the devil left him forever. You will have seasons of satanic attention. And seasons when Satan appears to leave you alone. But he's always observing you. He's always watching you. He's always calculating. He has a two year plan for your downfall. A five year plan for your downfall. He knows what kind of women you like. He knows how much money you like. He knows what kind of house you like. He knows your weaknesses. And he's plotting planning, strategizing to give that thing to you at some point when you are most vulnerable Satan will come again to make you a better deal than the one that he made you the first time of course you should know Satan has no good deals if it's not good it can be better so let me get down to answering the question now why is it that people go to seek the demonic world to get answers 
when people run out of options, when the pain is more than they can bear, when they can't handle the stress and pressure of the present moment, <coughs> when life is giving them more whoopings than blessings, they will want to go to a power higher than they are, and most of the time, they will not seek God because God always seems to take too long to do what he's doing. But Satan always seems to give you a shortcut and to give you immediate attention, instant gratification. And many people go for the instant gratification as opposed to waiting on the Lord. Number one, people go to the satanic world, the juju, voodoo, obia, native doctor because they want to see the future they want to get assurances. Saul wanted to see the future. Saul wanted to get assurances that it, everything was going to be all right. And they go to Satan because they don't believe in God's power to make everything go right. And so, because they can't wait on God, they have this level of impatience. They want the quick fix. You got that right. They want it fixed last week. And so they go to the Obia man, and he says, I'm going to do this for you. It's going to be done by next week. They go to the Obia woman, it's going to be done by next week. They go to the voodoo, the juju, the sifar, the necromancer, hydromancer, moonmancer, bibliomancer. They go to the witches and wizards and warlocks, and they have a simple solution for a price. But the price you pay, that chicken, that liquor, that money, that gold, that silver that you give to them, that ain't the real price. What they have gotten there is your allegiance and you are now connected to Satan and his kingdom. That's the part they don't tell you. And in view that you have children or a wife or people that are related to you, all of your blood relatives are now also connected to that satanic world. Even though they had no deals with the devil because of blood connection. You married to that wife, they twain shall be one flesh. You are joined, your soul tied to your wife. And because you're tied to her, even though she didn't go and you went, whatever deal you made with that devil, your wife has made that deal unbeknownst to her. This is where people don't get information. You run about the place trying to see far, trying to see into the future, not knowing that you're connecting your entire bloodline to a demonic system that is out to kill, steal, and destroy. That's the only agenda Satan has. Killing, stealing, and destroying. So you go, number one, to see the future. Number two, people go to these uh, satanic anointed people to know the unknown. Saul wanted to know the unknown. What's going to happen when these people attack me? How are things going to work out for me? Am I going to be victorious in this battle? Is God going to be with me? Is it good in my future? Am I going to die in this fight? What will become of my children? Will my children become kings after me? What about Mephibosheth? How will he survive without me, his grandfather? All of that was running through his mind. And now that he wanted to know the unknown, he went to the witch at Endor, and she, as it were, raised up the spirit of Samuel. And the spirit told Saul, I have already told you, pretending to be Samuel, that you're going to have the kingdom divided, David is going to be king, and God will take away your army, meaning they will die in battle against their enemies. It wasn't good news. It wasn't good news. The next thing is, people go to the satanic world to see the future, get assurances, to know the unknown, and thirdly, to get cures. To get cures. When I was in Africa, the membership of the church that I went to was 50,000 strong. When they shouted hallelujah, the earth would ring. And then one night, to my shock, and to my horror, the pastor broke into tears. <clears throat> when we asked him what happened, he said, a lot of the men, the pastors who were under him, under his leadership, in his organization, were going to the native doctors, the juju witchcraft guys, to get power to control the church, to get power so that the people would come under their influence, to get power so that when they spoke to the members, to give, the people would give, because this demonic power would so overwhelm and convince them 
that they would respond to get power to attract crowds. And he said no matter what he did to stop them, to tell them to pray and fast, they did not want to take the long route of praying and fasting. They wanted an easy road. And ministers who were preaching from the Bible were going to the native fetish doctors to get their charm and fetish so that they could control and manipulate audiences and cause people to come to their ministry so that their church would look like it's growing overnight. <coughs> and people who couldn't tell the anointing from a demonic power, they were attracted to those churches to get cures. And so we asked them, well, how do these cures work? And that's when the horror story began. A familiar spirit would attach itself to the pastors who went to the native doctor. That familiar spirit would gather information from the family and tell the pastor that information. For instance, somebody has a lump on their neck in the family, but they are not present at the service. But a member of that family related to the person with the lump on their neck would be present in the audience. The familiar spirit will give that indication, that message to the pastor. Somebody is here with a lump on their neck and their name is thus and so. The pastor now having received that information would say it on the speaker, on the microphone. And then that person would stand up and say, yes, I have an aunt at home. She has a lump on her neck. The pastor would then challenge them to bring that person to the next service. By then, the crowd is shouting hallelujah, glory to God, thank you Jesus. They bring that person with a lump. The pastor calls them up, puts his hand or not on their neck and prays. The lump disappears. The lump disappears in front of five, six hundred people. Now those people are convinced that this man of God, quote unquote, has healing powers from Jesus' kingdom. And then they would go and bring all of their relatives who are sick. And that thing would multiply and multiply. And then now the familiar spirit is joined by a spirit of infirmity. This is a spirit that afflicts with different kinds of sicknesses, diseases, maladies, abnormalities, malfunctions, misalignments, lumps, growths, etc., etc. This spirit of infirmity now would afflict different people in the audience. By now, there is a cooperation between the spirit of infirmity and the familiar spirit and the pastor. So he would call out, you have thus and so sickness happening here. The spirit of infirmity will afflict people. What looks like cancer, what looked like AIDS, what, whatever, whatever. And that pastor would lay his hands on them and command that thing to come off of them. The spirit of infirmity that is working with the pastor would come off of that person. The people in the audience would be convinced that the pastor has God's healing power. They will attract thousands more of their relatives, hundreds more of their relatives. Everybody would bring more people. The church is growing exponentially. And between that spirit of infirmity and that familiar spirit, working with the pastor, before long the church has 10,000, 12,000, 15,000, 20,000. To get cures, people would go to the native doctor, to the Obia house. Because they have this everlasting sore foot, this everlasting elephantitis, this everlasting diabetes, this everlasting whatever, whatever, whatever. And they don't want to wait on God. And the doctors have said there is no cure. And so to get themselves free from this thing that is connecting itself to them, they go to the fake source, they get fake power, they get fake healing. But the other thing they don't tell you <coughs> is that that lump that left that man's neck will attach itself to somebody else in that service. And by next week, you have another person with a lump on their neck. And they, that thing will repeat itself over and over. And they're attracting audiences. And people are going wild thinking this is the real power of God. People go to the satanic world, to the native doctor, voodoo, juju, obia, to get cures for that which cannot be cured by other means. They go there to get cures. What else, Rev? I'm glad you asked. People go to these sources to drive away evil. Now note, Satan does not cast out Satan. That infirmity, that lump on the neck that went away, Satan didn't cast it out. He just displaced it, removed it from one client because he has now pulled all the audience he could pull from that fake miracle with that one person. But somebody else gets the same infirmity, the same lump on their neck. By tomorrow, they get up with an oversized lump. They don't know where it came from. 
And because the pastor cured the first person, they think that he has the power to heal them. They come, it comes off of their neck. He passes on to a young child, and so the thing goes on and on and on. Satan is regurgitating his same mess over and over, and more and more people are attracted to the church. To see the future and get assurances, that's why they go. To know the unknown, that's why they go. To get cures, that's why they go. To drive away evil, that's why they go. Now, evil does not drive away evil, but evil can displace evil to another location. And now the person from which the evil has been displaced, they are convinced that God is good to them. And they say, thank you, Jesus. But because Jesus did not do it, the praise and the credit goes to Satan and he takes it. Now he has an entire family convinced of his healing power and they think it is Jesus. Some people do not know Jesus from the Antichrist. There is a revival that's coming to our world. Two revivals are coming. One is the genuine power of God. One is a fake satanic Kundalini anointing. Both of them look similar. The only distinction between the two is that one of them will have the joy of the Lord. In the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. There are people that can dance in the spirit of the Lord with the joy of the Lord on their face. And there are people that can dance, same dance, sometimes a better dance, better dance moves, but they have a contorted, twisted facial expression that tells you, if you have any discernment at all, that this is not the Lord's doing and it's not marvelous in our eye. But for the average Joe Blow Christian, any dance they think is Jesus doing it because it's happening in church. People go to the satanic world to drive away evil. Objects in the room, in the house, started flying by themselves. Spoons and forks falling off from where they are by, by some invisible power. Pots and pans flying through the air. Beds that people are supposed to sleep on, levitating in the air with the occupant on top of it. The person weighs 150 pounds, the bed weighs 5, 10 pounds, and the bed and the person on the bed are rising in the air and floating. I've seen stuff that will make your hair curl. But you can't talk about some of these things because people don't believe, even when they see the power of God, the real thing that God does. They go to the satanic world to drive away evil. We have had incidents here where schools have mass hysteria. It happened here in this country. It happened in some other countries in the Caribbean where children in the school get demonically possessed and start to scream and carry on. They're literally seeing demonic powers. And these entities are coming into the school and stressing out the staff and harassing the children. Demonic power. And people will go to the Obia house to drive the power away. They come with their little tread. They come with their little uh, feather. They come with their little oil of John the Conqueror. They come with a little water. They come with a little needle and, and uh, clove and spice in a little bottle. They come with a little rum. They come with a little uh, chicken blood. They come with a little goat blood. They, they have all this kind of paraphernalia. What they don't have is the name of Jesus and the power of the anointing of God on them. That's what they don't have. And you don't want that. You like the abracadabra stuff. You like these little queer little uh, games and, and, and con artistry and all that stuff. People generally don't like the raw power of God. They like gimmickry. I'm so tired of the gimmicks in the church. You just get sick and want to vomit. But people love gimmicks. They don't want the raw, unadulterated word of God. They, they like a show. And there will always be some preacher that will put on a show as long as he can get the audience and get money out of them. He's happy doing it that way. People go to these entities to drive away evil. And evil cannot drive away evil. What happens a lot of times is that the one power that this voodoo guy has may be stronger than the power of the person who did the first work. And so his power calms that first one down. But now you have two demonic powers in your house, in your family, in your bloodline. You are giving credit to the man that he drove away the evil, but he didn't drive away the evil, he suppressed it. And somewhere down the line, something will happen to cause both of them to start acting up. And now you're worse off 
Because you have more power, more demonic power in your life. Next thing is, people go to the satanic world, satanic power, to get money, to get wealth, to get riches, overnight riches, sensational riches. Satan told Jesus, if you bow down to me, I will give you the kingdoms of the world. Jesus told Satan, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. People go to the satanic world to get rich. They will sell their children to the demonic power to get rich. They must get rich. They will get rich. And even though the devil is killing members of the family, they keep that vow with Satan because they like easy money. They don't like to smell their sweat. They don't like to toil for it. They don't like to get riches a little at a time and build it up. They want it to come overnight. And they go to Satan and Satan will make such a deal. But he will kill off a whole lot of y'all. Satan will make such a deal. But he will connect you to the demonic world and you can't get free. He will connect your children to the satanic system and they can't get free. As long as you visit an Obia house, a voodoo house, a necromancer house, a palm reader's house, a seafar house, a go by the river and sprinkle stuff house, a ancestral libation pouring water stuff house, you have connected yourself to the satanic world and they are going to stay with your family and havoc is going to be wreaked on all y'all. He's going to wreck that family. He's going to bring massive destruction, death, loss of your soul in hell. That's all Satan is good for. He's heading to the lake of fire, which was made for him and his angels, but he's carrying some people with him who want to get rich quick. Are you feeling a brother now? My last point. No, my, uh, to see the future and get assurance is that one. To know the unknown, that's two. To get cures, that's three. To drive away evil, that's four. To get rich, that's five. And I told you seven. Number six, to charm men, to charm women, or to charm people. There are some people that do not depend on their good looks or their good intelligence or their good personality to attract somebody that they will marry girlfriend, boyfriend situation, in love situation, or just nice people who are good to them. They don't think that they have the personality. They don't think that they have the, the, the facial beauty. They don't think that they have the intelligence to have friends who are real, genuine friends. So they go to the Obia house to get a charm. And what this charm does, it makes people like you even when they would not have liked you for any other reason. To charm. I had this friend who left the church, joined himself to this mother. The mother was nothing but a witch and an obia woman. She had a very pretty daughter. He got himself connected with the daughter, moved in with the daughter, and was living with her for years and years and years. When I saw him, he did not look like himself. So I asked him, what happened? He said, man, I don't know what to tell you. And the Lord said, he's under a charm. So I told him blunt. I said, listen to me. You're under a charm. He looked shocked. And he said, I think so, you know. I said, I know so, you know. I know so. So I said, why don't you meet me at some public place? We can sit down and have a chat. Let me see if I can trace where this thing is coming from or who this thing is coming from. He said, all right. We will meet in the city at a church in Kitty. We're going to meet. I'm not going to come in. We're going to stand out in the yard and we'll have a nice discussion. I will, I will give you some info and you'll see if you can figure anything out. Because he knew that um, I had this ability. I still have it to suss things out. Not only by the spirit, but in the natural, evidence can be given to you. And because of years of experience in that particular spiritual warfare aspect of kingdom living, you can literally tell by observation when this thing started or who are the possibilities that brought this kind of evil and control because it's a control spirit into his life. And we were at a point where he broke down and started crying. Me and him and a couple other people. He was crying. He said, my, my, my friend, 
I want to be free from this thing. I know that this family has me under their thumb. And ever so often, I would have a moment of clarity. I would have a moment of sanity. But I don't know what happens. I will go right back into the same control. They control me. And I want to be free from this thing. And he, he started a big man crying. I was so sorry for him. I said, all right. I know what to do to get this thing from off of you. He said, I know what to do too. And he did. For God's sake, we went to Bible college together. Three years of hard study. Anyhow, before I could get into explaining to him what steps he could take, a car pulled up at the church and a tall, stately woman walked out. Figure like a trigger. Smile with teeth like ivory. Flashing, dashing smile. She walked past me and put her hand on his shoulder and called his name. And you could literally see him come to attention. And he was under a spell. She took him by the hand and walked him out into the car. And he waved to me and said, I'll see you another time. And they were gone. She could control him if she could put her hands on him, on any part of his body. As long as she touched him, that thing on her could control his mind. She had him charmed, controlled by her power. This brilliant graduate of a Bible college was under a spell that this woman had him on. He was charmed. He couldn't help himself. He was charmed. He became like a living zombie when he walked away from her like a little child with the mother holding them by the hand. He was powerless, helpless. I could see it in his eye. He was pleading with me to help him with his eye, but his mouth wasn't saying anything. And she smiled and turned and looked at me and gave me this, this uh, conquering look like, I got you, Rev, and there's nothing you can do about it. She slammed the door, give me that smile again, and drove off with him. How did she know where to find him? I met him later in the week. And I asked him, how did she know where to find you? And he said, her mother has this ability to see far. <laughs> her mother has this ability to see far. The mother told her where to find him. And told her to get there fast. Because he was with a man that was going to give him some secret and once he knows those secrets, he can be free from your charm. Go get him, my daughter. The daughter came and got him. Got him out of my grasp, out of the churchyard, for God's sake. Gone with the man. About a week later, I saw him again. Sheer coincidence. Coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. The poor fellow, when he saw me, it was like he saw Santa Claus at Christmas time. He ran over, he said, uh, cause um, I can get free now, you know. I said, yes. He said, I want to be free now. And I said, look, you have to do this, this, and this. You have to say this, this, and this. No magical nothing, just biblical, systematic approach to breaking free for whom the sun set free. Oh, rucka shucker is free indeed. And now, we said, look, we're going to go to the botanical garden somewhere. And I called a couple other people because I wanted some support. I wanted two of us to agree because I knew I wasn't dealing with any little small boy demon here. This was a major principality that was on this guy. And it would relay information to her. And before long, she might come to these gardens and drag the joker and take him back. Take him back to wherever she got him from. And so I called the other people and said, come now. We're going to be at the... But I said, we who? He said, don't matter. You come now. And they came. And we got him there. And he made his confession to God. And whom the Son set free is free indeed. That presence on him, that charm on him, slithered away. You could, you could feel the sensation of a snake crawling away defeated left us, left him, and crawled its way away from him. When he was free, you could see 
a change in his facial expression. He shook hands with the people around him. And he said, I feel like a truck has come off of me. Yes, whom the son. Now, everything operates by faith, but sometimes faith is so tangible that the evidence can be recognized by the facial expression. His walk changed. His talk changed. There was a brightness in his countenance that was unbelievable. And then everybody dispersed, and guess what? He said, uh, let's go to the church. And uh, I was living at the church at the time. He hadn't seen my wife for a long time. Uh, my wife's mother and him were very good friends. He wanted to go see her to say hi and to leave off. When we got there, guess who was waiting at the bridge? The same woman that he was shacking up with. She came over. And when she tried to touch him, one of the young women snatched her hand and said, in the name of Jesus, every time she tried, they blocked her. They weren't allowing that power, that charm on her to touch him to see if it would work again. The next thing we knew, somebody pulled up. Somebody else pulled up. And he recognized the person and walked into their vehicle and drove off. That individual is free from that charm Free never to go back to the beggarly elements of being under a spell charmed by a woman. As long as she could touch him, she had him under control. As long as she could touch him, his resistance would break down. As long as she could touch him, as long as she put hands on him, that power on her would manipulate him and control him and turn him into a zombie. But that power was broken. That spell was broken. And the people who were in that yard that day, they ran interference to prevent her from touching him again. But now, if and when she touches him, her power is broken from off of him. Poor guy got married to somebody later on. Broke her charm. People go to the witches and wizards because they don't believe in their personality. They don't believe that uh, they can be free. They don't believe that they have what it takes to attract another human being to themselves. And they go to the Obia house to get a charm so people will like them because they are not likable in their own eyes. They need a charm to attract people. Lady, you see your husband misbehaving, going to that other woman. When you see the woman, you have to laugh. Like, why would he cheat down? Why wouldn't he cheat up? The woman is not as good looking as you, or so you think. She doesn't have it going on like you, or so you think. She doesn't have hair like you, hips like you, lips like you, and fingertips like you. And yet, she has gone with him. And every time he calls her name, every time she calls his phone, you could literally see a transformation happen to him. And he's finding every excuse to go out of that house because he's under a spell. He's under a charm. That charm can be broken. That spell can be broken. That control manipulative mechanism can be broken by the power of the blood of Jesus, by the power of the name of Jesus, by the power of the word of God, by the power of confession, by God giving power to the faint and to them that have no might, increasing their strength so the weak can say, I am strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. There is nobody like the Lord to break a chain, to break a hex, to break a vex, to break a jinx, to break a curse, to break a charm, to break a spell, and to set free any captive whom the Son set free. Jesus Christ is the greatest liberator that the world has ever seen or known. Finally, people go to the voodoo house, the juju house, the obia house, the hydromancer, the moonmancer, the necromancer, the palm reader, the seafar, the occult, the raban, the pinon, the thing that they drink, the thing that they sat on, the thing that they smell, the thing that they buried under the front step, the back step, the thing that they buried in the yard, the handkerchief that controlled, all these other paraphernalia and mechanisms that they use, the thing that they threw in the yard, the powder that they want you to mash, etc., etc. I can go through a plethora of things that I know about because I have confronted these demonic powers Time and time again, there's rarely a month where I don't get in touch with somebody who's under that kind of charm, under that kind of spell. And Jesus can set every captive free. People go to the, uh, to the Obia house because they want to acquire to themselves power of a supernatural origin. It is interesting, as I watched the last <clears throat> elections, that a certain leader 
every time he met with the leader of the nation, he had a particular hand movement that he would do. He had a particular way he would set his finger. He had a particular place he would stand and invoke his thing. And the other individual, poor fellow, did not know what was going on. It seemed like this man was always able to run roughshod over him. And he became easy and speakeasy. As bright as he was, as intelligent as he was, as trained as he was, he was unable to muster any kind of fight because something about this man, his deport, his disposition, and that man knew that he had invoked powers of a supernatural origin. And so he was always able to run roughshod over the other guy. People go to that world to get powers of a supernatural origin. They want to be able to control people. They want to be able to manipulate. They want to be able to terrorize. They want to be able to tie up babies in people's wombs. They want to be able to put curses on people. They want to be able to visit in the night. They want to be able to do astral projection. They want to be able to do palm reading, mind reading. They want to receive from the supernatural world psychic power. They want to be an obia practitioner, a voodoo practitioner, a juju practitioner. They want to have power from the dark world. Of course, they don't call it power from the dark world. They say they're working with God. Everybody who has that supernatural power, they claim that it's God who's using them. God does not do juju. God does not do voodoo. God does not do sifar. God does not do obia. God does not hurt other people. By sending out curses and vexes and jinxes and spells on them. I can tell you stories, but I refuse to tell stories tonight. What I'm saying to you, these are the main seven reasons why people go to these individuals. Because they know that if life is going to shift, you're going to need another level of power to make it shift. All these people talking about pouring libation, they're invoking, they say, ancestral spirits. They know that the natural realm can tap into the spirit realm and that the spirit realm has more power than the natural realm. And sometimes when you've taken it to the extent and to the zenith of the human power and intelligence, supernatural power and intelligence must now kick in to give you the advantage, to give you the edge over whoever or whatever you're trying to conquer. They know that. They know that the spirit realm has serious power to make things happen that the natural realm does not have. They know that the spirit realm can take them from star to superstar. They know that. They know that the spirit realm can make a 10 million sale when the natural will only sell 1 million. They know that. And they will do whatever it takes to invoke and to invite that supernatural power to come and work in their behalf. They know that. They know that the spirit realm is more real than the natural realm. They know that. They know that Satan will assist them if they make a deal with him, if they make a blood oath, a blood covenant with him. They know that. And some of us, on the other side of the spectrum, we know that there is no power like the power of God. We know that there is no knowledge like the knowledge that God gives. We know that there is no prophetic insight like the prophetic insight to detail that God can give. We know that there is no hex. There is no vex. There is no jinx. There is no curse. There is no spell that God cannot break. We know that man is mighty, but God is almighty. We know that men are natural, but God is supernatural. We know that men are good, but God is great. We know that God is a chain breaker. We know that God is a curse breaker. We know that God can break a hex, break a vex, break a jinx, break a curse, break a spell. We know that no matter how long Satan has had a victim, the mighty power of God can come down upon an individual and rock a shocker. That God can tear up a house and bring the foundation up. That God can cause a big fish to vomit his Jonah 
that God can part the Red Sea and drown the army of Pharaoh, that God can bring to naught the powers of hell like nobody's business, that there is no juju, no witchcraft that can bind a city. But if one preacher who knows the word, the name of Jesus and the power of the blood, that he can break that jinx from off of that community, break that jinx from off of that city, break that jinx from off of that family, break that jinx from off of that house, I break the jinx. I break the jinx. I break the curse. I break the jinx. I break the infirmity. I break the power that caused that e everlasting sore foot. I break the power that caused that elephantitis in the right leg, in the left leg. I break the power. I break the power of sugar diabetes over the family. I curse cancer. I curse cancer. I curse corona. I curse it in the powerful name of Jesus. I make a decree and a declaration that the mighty power of the almighty God is going to work through these airwaves. And as my voice reverberates across the corridors of your home or your car or wherever you are, you will feel supernatural power come into that room, come into that car, come into that house, come into that church, come into that place wherever you are and touch you and break curses, kill the snake, slay the dragon, Drive out Leviathan, pierce him with his mighty sword. May the hand of God, may the mighty power of deliverance go to work in your behalf. Jesus did not shed all of that blood for you to be under the spell of the devil, under the jinx of the devil, under the hex of the devil, under the curse of the devil, under the cross of the devil. I break every cross that you're not supposed to carry. I take the poison from out of the arrow that has been shot against you. Your eyes shall open wide and your mind shall be clear. I rebuke the power of insanity in your household. In the name of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, I wage war on the behalf of my nation. And I declare that there shall be no local power, no national power, no international power, no regional power that can have any permanent say with regard to this land. Guyana shall rise. Guyana shall rise. Guyana shall rise like Jesus from the dead and shall stand up tall, stand up strong, and the people of the world shall know that this nation is married to Almighty God and the glory of God, the grace of God, the touch of God, the hand of God, the light of God, the love of God, the mercy of God shall be displayed in this nation like nobody's business. Let God arise and let the enemy be scattered. Satan, your plans will not prevail. Satan, your works will not prevail. All of the manipulations of men, all of the evil machinations of men, I bring them to naught. I bring them to naught. I curse their plan. There shall be no blood shedding in this nation of ours. The peace of God shall reign from sea to shining sea. Let God arise. Lord, send your warring angels. Send your angels of war. Send your angels of battle to quell the violence in the hearts of men, to rebuke the hate that emanates and permeates from the very pores of their being. That every time we see them talking, every time we hear them talking, we can hear the vindictiveness. We can hear the spitefulness. They don't want peace. They want war. But there shall be no war. There shall be peace in this land. All of the 83,000 square miles of this land shall come under the auspices of his imperial majesty, the Lion of Judah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God from heaven, the Christ for every crisis, the chain breaker, the resurrector, the lion and lamb of zoology, the song mind giver of psychiatry, the most brilliant mind of intellectuality, the fresh loaf of bread from heaven's bakery, the man with the keys to your penitentiary, the resurrection and the life in the cemetery, the best vintage wine of heaven's brewery, the most nourishing bread from heaven's bakery. Jesus, 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 Jesus. I call his name. May Christ reign in all of the 80 and 3,000 square miles of this nation. 
May the Prince of Peace have his way as the Lord snatches the future of this nation and make it happen that no man would have his say. Let God have his way in this cooperative republic of Guyana in the name of Jesus. Shout your amen. Let the amens come. Glory to God. Oh, I felt that one. Yeah, I haven't behaved that badly in a chair. But every now and then, the power of God will arise. Every now and then, the hand of the Lord will arise. You make a decree concerning this nation that there shall be shalom, shalom. There shall be shalom, shalom. There shall be peace, peace. We want peace, no more trouble. We want peace, no more war. There shall not be sanctions in this nation. To the glory of God, in the name of Jesus.